Our next speaker is Dr. Emily Storer, and she is the Rita J. Kaplan and Susan B. Kaplan Curator of Jewelry at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and a visiting lecturer in the History of Art Department at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. At the MFA, Emily oversees a collection that spans nine curatorial departments and 6,000 years of history. She's curated exhibitions and written on various aspects of adornment. Most recently, she co-curated Boston May, Arts and Crafts Jewelry and Metalwork, and contributed to Winged Beauty, The Butterflies of Wallace Chan, and the Journal of Dress History. As an educator, Emily has lectured and taught on a diverse range of jewelry, fashion, and design-related topics. She holds a PhD in humanities from Salve Regina University and a Master of Arts in Fashion and Textile Studies from the Fashion Institute of Technology. And her lecture for our conference is Remembrance of Things Past, Jewelry, Memory, and Self-Presentation. Please welcome Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Storer, the Rita J. Kaplan and Susan B. Kaplan Curator of Jewelry at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about the powerful relationship between jewelry and memory. Tokens of affection, objects of remembrance, and gifts of celebration, jewelry often marks important events in our life. Pre presented at the birth of a child, a wedding, anniversary, or even the death of a loved one, like Proust's Madeline, jewelry brings about thoughts of the moments it was given and who gave it. Sometimes it's hard to look at the jewelry we wear or collect without immediately being transported back to the moment we received it. Many years later, it might continue to conjure the emotions it brought about days, years, or decades ago. Jewelry is small, intimate, precious, and a conveyor of wealth, but also a communication device. Think of the former Secretary of State Mad Madeleine Albright's jewelry and how she used brooches to communicate her mood or desires on any given day. Using a historical framework, much can be learned about the people and culture a particular ornament emerged from and what it meant both individually and collectively. In this pendant brooch from the MFA collection, Close examination reveals who it depicts, what it depicts, and who created each of the elements of it. Made of watercolor on ivory, it also incorporates hair work. Standing at the center of the pendant is Ruth McConnell of Huntington, Pennsylvania. To her right are two urns with the initials WM and TM. These represent her children who've died, and you see them as angels floating in the clouds. The mother, gestures up towards them as she stands under the symbolic weeping willow tree. On the reverse is inscribed, in memory of T.M. McSee, age six years and three months, and W.H. McSee, age two years and 10 months. And then, made by Perry and Musgrave, Philadelphia, September 13th, 1792. On the reverse of the ivory panel is another mark, noting the hair worker, J. Boone of 33 South Street in Philadelphia. Hair is one of the most intimate materials used in jewelry. And in a work like this, I would expect this, the mother's hair and both of the children's hair. This would have allowed the three of them to be linked after death and for the mother to hold close to her body a piece of her children. With deep symbolism clearly evident in its design, as it was worn, it would have been obvious to anyone who came in contact with the person wearing it that it was an object of mourning. More subtle examples of hair work jewelry, which is so well suited to the idea of remembrance or tokens of love and affection, exist here. This bracelet on the left is one of my very favorite pieces from the MFA collection. On initial examination, it's very simple. A gold bangle bracelet with the gold charm hanging from it. However, the locket element hinges open to reveal another small ball inside. The interior spins to cycle through the plaited hair of four family members, father, mother, George, Robert. And it is inscribed RCB to HMW 1864. Perhaps this example is less an object of mourning than one of memory. 
highly personal, the sentiment of this bracelet is just for the wearer, not for the viewer. When looking at this British portrait, which dates to almost exactly the same moment as the bracelet, I can't help but wonder if the necklace worn, worn holds, holds a similar secret element. Today, I want to talk to you about three examples of jewelry that reveal something about the wearer or maker, and in considering memory, offer us insight into faith, love, and place. Two years ago, around the time I was asked to give this lecture, I was invited to Harvard University Art Museums to take a closer look at this painting. As a jewelry curator, I'm rarely invited to look at paintings. So this seemed like a sign. I was struggling with what kind of with what I knew of jewelry made in the South and where to even begin this talk. And here I was asked to consider this portrait made in New Orleans around 1840 and to think about her jewelry, voila. The painting was acquired by Harvard in 2017 and curators were interested to learn more about who this young woman was. The painter is an important one. Julian Hudson was an antebellum painter with a studio in the French Quarter of New Orleans. He's among the earliest American painters of African descent. In 2010, the historic New, New Orleans collection mounted an exhibition and book titled In Search of Julian Hudson, Free Artist of Color in Pre-Civil War New Orleans. The artist studied in Paris with the former students of Jacques-Louis David. Hudson's untimely death at the age of 33 meant that he left relatively few paintings behind and much is still being learned about his life and career. This portrait was made in 1840, shortly after Hudson's second trip to Paris. The sitter is unknown, but it's thought to be a free woman of color from New Orleans. It's unknown who owned this painting before it arrived in Kansas City, Missouri in the late 1920s. Who is this? Does the jewelry communicate anything about who she is? She's wearing a fashionable white dress with black lace gloves and a matching shawl. The covered up nature of the dress likely makes it a late morning or afternoon dress. The neckline and transparency of the sleeves does reveal some skin and garments tended to become more revealing as the day progressed. In February of 1840, Queen Victoria wed Prince Albert wearing a white dress. Before this, white was not yet the preferred color for weddings. Women tended to wear their best dress, which might be white, but not necessarily. So the white color doesn't immediately make this a wedding portrait. Let's zoom in. The first thing I noticed was this necklace because I was unsure of what it was. It's a fine gold chain with a pendant featuring a diving bird with outstretched wings. The wings are attached to the necklace with these two chain elements. Her earrings feature a rosette, a stylized uh, flower with a circular center and then circles all around. You can see this motif replicated in the pattern on her dress and on the border of her shawl. The pendant represents the spirit of spree. This is a religious symbol shown as a bird, often a dove, diving down from heaven and is worn as a symbol of faith. You find similar styles being worn by French Catholics in France, as well as Quebec and presumably New Orleans. It's usually a pendant hung on a ribbon. This delicate and refined all gold version is unique and could have been made by someone locally in New Orleans. The wearing of this necklace means that the woman was comfortable being Catholic during a moment when Catholics were not necessarily welcome. Perhaps things were different in New Orleans, but elsewhere in the country, Catholics were the subject of widespread discrimination, and it would have been unusual for one to flaunt their Catholicism in such a highly visible manner. She's putting herself out there being painted in a necklace like this. The earrings are either diamond, glass, or topaz, and likely date to the Georgian period or before, making them slightly earlier than the painting. They're likely paste. This is the name for early costume jewelry. That's my gut, given that she is wearing daytime clothes. If they're diamond, they indicate that she was married and well-to-do. Her clothing seems to also reflect that, but it would be unusual to wear diamonds before the evening. 
Diamond rosettes, like the ones you see on the left, were popular in the first few decades of the 19th century. A central round stone surrounded by others of equal or slightly larger size can be seen in earrings, rings, and necklaces from this period. When you find them today, they're sometimes taken from elements of a broken or discarded jewel, like a necklace. Stylistically, there's a disconnect between the necklace and the earrings. Perhaps the necklace is hers and the earrings are not. The rosette earrings are about glamour and high style, but the necklace is religious. The earrings and the necklace are at odds. It's a mismatch. It's possible that Hudson took creative license with the earrings. They match so many other elements of the ensemble, the dress, the lace, the flowers. But the necklace is most telling. In Martha Gandy Fale's seminal book, Jewelry in America, she only went as far south as Charleston, South Carolina. This was because of access that she had to public collections. Jewelry from New Orleans is largely unstudied in terms of its unique jewelry history. But looking at this portrait here, a similar necklace is worn by Mademoiselle Lezen Bencel II. The painting by Luigi Maria Sota which is now in the collection of the Louisiana State Museum, was painted at exactly the same time as the Hudson painting. Born on September 21st, 1816, Marie Joseph Lennon was baptized February 16th, 1817. She was the daughter of Joseph Marmillan and Michael Lennon, sorry, Josephine Marmillan and Michael Lennon. Her father was a doctor born in Ireland and the family resided in Louisiana. Her, art own, her aunt owned Evergreen Plantation, located on the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Considered a Creole de Moselle, she married Lenzen Bencel in 1834. Seven years later, her husband commissioned three portraits, his own, this one, and one of his mother. In each, they wore black, but it's unclear if the family was in mourning. Bencel is remembered by her son as being a devout Catholic. Like the woman in the Hudson painting, she too wears the spirit of spree around her neck. The choice conveys that she sought to capture her piety in this portrait. The black color possibly relates to mourning. It's not uncommon for Catholic Creole women to wear necklaces like this. At the time when much of the country witnessed anti-Catholic, anti-Irish sentiments, New Orleans, with its strong ties to both French and Spanish culture, had a different religious history, one that was perhaps more welcoming of Catholics. Like the portrait of Mademoiselle Becknell, this is a pious young woman. For now, we can say that she's a young Catholic woman, dressed at the height of fashion, Hopefully, this woman's mysterious identity will reveal itself in time. We'll fast forward 20 years and travel 11 hours north to consider the jewelry of Mary Todd Lincoln. Two years older than Becknell, Mary Todd was born December 13, 1818 in Lexington, Kentucky. As a child, Todd was educated by French tutors. Her father, Robert Smith Todd, was a local businessman and politician. And surrounded by figures like Senator Henry Clay, she grew up to have an interest in politics. So perhaps it's not unusual that she married a politician. In 1842, Mary Todd married Abraham Lincoln. Not as wealthy as his bride's family, the Lincolns lived in a middle-class life. With a love of finery, that shifts from an upper class life of this shift from an upper class life of privilege was a difficult one for Mrs. Lincoln. The jewelry that you see her wearing here is part of the Smithsonian's collection. Lincoln's jewelry came to the library in 1937 as part of a gift from her granddaughter, Mary Lincoln Isham. Tiffany and Company records indicate that President Abraham Lincoln purchased the items on April 28, 1862 in Manhattan. The pearl necklace sold for $180 and the two bracelets for $350. The jewelry is made of small seed pearls and relatively speaking is a modest ornament. But nonetheless, it seems to have been one that she favored. Mary Todd Lincoln wore the jewelry to the second Lincoln inaugural ball in 1865. 
In terms of identity and memory, I'm interested to talk specifically about a demi purr in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. This is a fancy way of saying a set, although it indicates that it's a set not big enough to be a suite of jewelry, which would have included earrings, bracelet, necklace, and brooch. Here you just see earrings and a brooch. Despite their size on your screen, they're relatively small and the brooch is not terribly larger than the earrings, which measure about one inch square. They're gold with old mine cut diamonds all under one carat and black tracery enamel creating what might be a stylized blossom with a center circle and petal like elements. The jewels date to Lincoln's White House years. This was a very difficult time for her and there's been much written about her mental health during her lifetime. There is much that we can't know, but what we know for sure is that her siblings had divided loyalties during the Civil War and as First Lady, this was stressful. And in 1862, her beloved son, Willie, died of typhoid fever. On February 20th, 1862, when William Wallace Lincoln died, he was the second of her four children to pass away. Willie had been described as her third and favorite son. Mary Todd Lincoln herself described him as an idolized child. It was around the time of his death that she bought this jewelry probably at Galt and Brothers in Washington, DC. Galt's was the local equivalent to Tiffany and Company in the 19th century. And the inclusion of black tracery enamel would have made them appropriate ornaments for late mourning. Records indicate that two years after Willie's death, towards the end of 1864, Lincoln purchased $3,200 worth of jewelry during a buying spree at Galt's. It's quite possible that this jewelry was purchased then. Now you know where this is going. Lincoln's suffering continued on April 14th, 1865, just a few months after purchasing this jewelry, she was seated next to President Lincoln in Ford Theater when he was assassinated. Lincoln's dressmaker, Elizabeth Heckley, described the first lady's grief. She was wailing and despondent. Forced to leave her home in the White House, Lincoln moved to Chicago with Heckley and her two surviving sons. As first lady, few retailers pursued her to pay her bills. However, after the president's assassination, assassination she was expected to pay off her $6,000 in debts. In 1867, Lincoln and Heckley planned the sale of a portion of her White House wardrobe. Known as the Old Clothes Scandal, the sale resulted in negative publicity and very little money. Among the objects she sold was this brooch and earrings from the MFA collection. An avid shopper with a keen interest in fashion, Mrs. Lincoln expected her clothes and jewelry to bring in a sum that would allow her to pay off her debts. The sale took place at Brady and Company's premises located at 609 Broadway in New York. The sale was surrounded by much publicity and most of it was negative. One West Virginia newspaper article described the sale as low, sordid, disgraceful. As a result, the article sold for less than expected. The article, this article in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper described and illustrated the jewelry several times. You can see it here in the lower right hand corner. This diamond brooch and matching earrings was listed for $350 which would have been the going price for a suite like this when it was new. There's no record of what it had sold for. Although Congress granted Mrs. Lincoln $22,000, the remainder of her husband's salary for the year in which he was killed, as well as $3,000 annuity for life, her troubles weren't over. Her youngest son, Tad, died in 1871 and her oldest and only surviving son, Robert, had his mother committed in 1875. Lincoln is a misunderstood figure. She was the first widow of an assassinated president, and she petitioned Congress for a widow's pension, something she was not guaranteed upon the death of her husband. For me, the jewelry speaks to a moment in her personal life, the death of her son, but also to the public memory of Lincoln. The story is a sad one, but it's empowering that in the midst of the 19th century, she was buying jewelry for herself, 
rather than waiting for her husband to buy it for her. The choices she made surely had personal meaning to her, which we can only guess at today. Finally, I want to end with this brooch by G. Paulding Farnham for Tiffany and Company. It offers us a different way to think about memory. The brooch is platinum, diamond, and pearl, created in the shape of a chrysanthemum blossom around 1904. The species of plant is native to China and Japan, but was increasingly seen in Western art after 1853. It's observed in designs by Tiffany and Company as early as 1880. G. Paulding Farnham, who went by Paul, joined Tiffany and Company in 1885 when he was just 26 years old. After studying to be a sculptor, he joined the preeminent American jewelry house Tiffany's. Eight years later, he was named the firm's chief designer and director of jewelry. He'd been celebrated for his orchid brooches at the Paris Exposition in 1889. And by the time this brooch on the left was designed, he was known for his eclectic design influences. His inspirations ranged from Aztec to Indian and Egyptian to Japanese. On the right, you see a group of Farnham's orchid brooches. Life-size in scale and meticulous in design, they demonstrate his love of the natural world and his ability to, rise jewel to bring jewelry to an art form. The designs combine matte enamel with gem encrusted stems, creating contrast in surface texture. The brooch on the left is quite different. Farnham had studied with Edward C. Moore, who in the late 19th century was one of the country's leading collectors of Islamic and Japanese art. Moore died in 1891, but Farnham continued to create work in his teacher's favorite style in 1893 and again in 1900. Moore trained Farnham to look at museum collections and directly at nature for his ideas and the details of his designs. At Tiffany's, Farnham had access to an extensive library that included works of Japanese art. But it's also quite possible that Farnham created this brooch by looking directly at floral specimens or by looking at prints. On the far right here is George Frederick Kunz. He was Tiffany and Company's chief gemologist from 1879 until his death in 1932. During his time at the firm, he introduced many American gemstones to Tiffany designers. Montana sapphires and other colored gemstones began to appear in jewelry retailed in the 19th century. In this brooch, the pearls come from the mighty Mississippi. Memory. What can materials tell us about a place? Pearls that come from the river are considered freshwater pearls. Kunz wrote, a large percentage of Mississippi River pearls are very irregular in form, many of them resembling dog's teeth, bird's wings, and the heads and bodies of different animals. Farnham was known to create drawings as part of the design process, but this brooch is quite different. Jewelers have different processes. Some start with pen and paper and others work directly with the materials. It seems that materials likely drove this chrysanthemum design. You can imagine Farnham at a table surrounded by pearls like these, trying to come up with what they could be and then how best to achieve the chrysanthemum blossom from these irregular materials. Sometimes jewelry speaks to a place. Think of the great jewelry of the Grand Tour. It begs the question, where did you get that? Which gets the wearer reflecting on their recent travels. Similarly, one can imagine those who saw this brooch being worn asking about its unusual gemstones. The American actress and singer Lillian Russell owned a version of this brooch. Her brooch included her initials and the date 1904. Russell was an important jewelry collector by 1910, she had reportedly amassed a collection worth more than $250,000. This is more than $6.5 million today. It's been said that chrysanthemums were her favorite flower and that pearls were her favorite gem. Pearls are combined here with platinum, a material that at the time this brooch was created were, was new to jewelry. It was challenging to work, but its lightness meant that brooches could be large scale without weighing down a garment in the way a similar design in gold or silver would. 
this striking ornament would have been a conversation starter. Are those pearls? Would have begun a discussion centered perhaps around the Mississippi River. Memory can exist in many ways, both individual and collective. Memory changes as jewelry gets handed from one generation to the next but always it remains a vehicle for storytelling. As you ponder this brooch, reflect on my lecture and prepare for this evening's cocktail hour, I hope that you might think about mixing yourself a bijou, the French word for trinket, it's also used to describe jewelry. Cheers, I look forward to seeing you shortly and answering any questions you might have. The Historic New Orleans Collection would like to thank New Orleans Silversmiths for its long-standing support of the Antiques Forum. Located at 600 Charter Street, the shop features unusual hand-selected estate and modern barware, jewelry, silver tableware, and more. Learn more at neworleanssilversmiths.com.